Assalamu alaikum everyone. Thank you for watching Idraq's YouTube channel. This is the seventh post in the protein structure series and in this post we will work towards developing a script that will help us address a research question. The question is regarding the hypothesis of hydrophobic collapse. The protein folding process is initiated where all water hating amino acids making up the protein, also known as the hydrophobic residues, collapse to make the core of the protein. Collapsing to make the core of the protein maximizes the shielding of these amino acids from the solvent, which is water in this case. Meanwhile, as this is happening, the polar or water loving amino acids like to stay on the surface of the protein where they can interact with this solvent. If the above is true, then if we were to analyze the protein, hydrophobic residues should be closer to the core as compared to the hydrophilic amino acids. While this can be tested in multiple ways, we will take a rather simple path. We will assume that protein structures take up a globular shape and hence we can fit a protein inside a sphere of a known radius R. We will then measure each amino acid's distance from the center of the sphere. The distances will then tell us if the amino acids are close to the center or further away from it. If the hydrophobic amino acids are lesser than the maximum distance away, then you can find support for the hydrophobic collapse hypothesis. If not, we have to rethink things. So let's get this started. I will be using the same PDB structure that I have used before, that is 1HV4.PDB and we will place that structure in an easily accessible location. So in my case, there is a folder called Idraq on my desktop. This folder has the subfolder called Protein Structure Series, which has my uh, PDB file, which is 1HV4.PDB inside it. We will now start our Jupyter Notebook. For those of you who are working in um, Linux, you can use your command prompt and the process might be slightly different for those of you who are working in the Windows environment. So we will start the Jupyter Notebook by, so like in Linux, all you have to do is to type in the command at the terminal, wait for a couple of seconds and you start so I will navigate to the location desktop truck protein structure series and here I can see that I have my PDB file so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch the Python notebook we're going to be using Python 3 so what we're going to do is we're going to build on the code that we did last time we're going to recycle parts of it I'm going to type in the code here are the opening lines of code they have been extensively discussed in the previous posts. What is new, I think, is the NumPy line and the import warnings line. So these are two libraries which we will be using today. The warning library is just there so that we can suppress warnings. So in the last section, in the last post when we discussed it, we talked about how importing the 1hv4.pdb structure into uh, in the Jupyter Notebook displays a pink block which displays a lot of warnings. What we're going to try and do is we're going to suppress those warnings because we don't care about them right now as they are not important to the task at hand. The other library is the NumPy library, which is a numerical Python library. So in these few lines of code that are shown here, what we have done is that we have declared a parser and using that parser, we have read in a structure called 1hv4.pdb and internally we have named it as a and we have given this uh, to the variable called structure. Now, if this were an NMR structure, and as I've discussed earlier, uh, what would have happened is that you would have had multiple models of the same structure in your PDB file. In this case, however, we already know that 1HV4 is an X-ray structure and it should hold only one model, which, and Python starts the numbering with zero. So this statement here, brings in the zeroth model and assigns it to the variable called model. You could have chosen, in case of NMR, you could have changed these numbers to, depending on how many models you actually had in your structure. Then from the model, we will extract chain A and we will label it to chain. This, I've, I'm not gonna go into more detail of this thing. There are diagrams in the earlier post which talk about this, which talk about the hierarchy of how a read in structure 
gets structured at different levels. So you can see the earlier posts if you want to refer to what is happening on the inside. So now we have already run this block and when we run this block, you can see that no warnings appear. And that is because we have suppressed those warnings in these two lines by importing the warnings library and by declaring that ignore any warnings. So the Jupyter Notebook does not display those warnings. If you want more details on what kind of warnings there were, you should refer back to post three where they were first introduced. So once the structure has been parsed, we can now get the information out of it. So from the construct I listed uh, earlier, the first thing that we need to do is to find the center of the structure. To do that, what we will do is collect all the X coordinates of the atoms and the Y coordinates of the atoms and the Z coordinates of all the atoms and sum all of them up. So sum all the X's and sum all the Y's and sum all the uh, Z coordinates. And if, for example, we have 100 atoms, after they have been summed up, we will divide them by the total number of atoms in the system. And that will give us three coordinates, one for X, one for Y and one for Z. And they will represent the three coordinates of the centroid of the three dimensional protein structure. So let's start to put in some code which does this. So I'm going to use the second block here. So in the first line, we declare some variables and initialize them. As explained earlier, we need to collect all the X coordinates, the Y coordinates and the Z coordinates and add them all together. What we do in these lines, as I've explained earlier, is that we loop over all the residues. While one residue is selected by the outer for loop, we loop over all the atoms in that residue using the inner for loop. When each atom is selected, atom.cord or C double O R D is a list that contains the X coordinate, which is represented by the zeroth entry here, Y coordinate, which is represented by one and the Z coordinate, which is represented by two. And what we're doing is that we are adding them uh, to the existing values of X, Y, and Z. Note that we initialized these X, Y, and Z as zero up here. This means that the first loop uh, zero will be added to X, Y, and Z coordinates of the first atom. In the second iteration of the for loop, we will add the sum obtained from the previous iterations to the X, Y, Z coordinates of the second atom. And that way we will keep on adding until we have gone through all of them. You will see that I have used the notation of plus equals to. This is a shorthand of writing that adds something to the existing value of the variable, right? The atom count variable at the end adds one as we loop over each atom. So it's just a counter, which tells us how many atoms have we actually collected data from. Once all the atoms of all the residues have been parsed, we come out of the for loop block. Then we divide the X that we have collected, the Y and the Z, which is which are actually all sums of all the X's, Y's and Z coordinates. We divide them by the total number of atoms, which contributed to those values. And then we end up with the X, Y and Z coordinates of the centroid. So by running this, we end up getting three values. The first value represents the X coordinate of the centroid, the second one, the Y, and the third one, the Z coordinate of the centroid. So we now have the center of the structure. This was step one. Step two is how far away are each of the residues from the center. To calculate that, what we have to do is to calculate the distance between the residues and the center that we just calculated. This creates a small problem. A residue contains many atoms. This means that we will have to measure each atom individually from the center. While this can be done, it is not going to make the analysis part any simple. It's actually going to make it quite messy. So what we are going to do is to make an approximation. We will calculate the centroid of each residue just like we did for the structure and use that centroid as a representative of that residue. What this will do is we will only have to measure uh, one distance per residue instead of measuring the distance of all the atoms of that particular residue. So you're obviously free to not follow in this line. You can choose the alpha carbon, uh, the carboxyl carbon, the beta carbon or any other atom in that residue. And actually, if you do that, you will your code will actually work faster. The reason for that is because you won't have to calculate their coordinates. Their coordinates are already listed in the PDB that you have access. So what we are going to do, however, is to actually calculate their centroids. So the first thing to remember in this case is that you've already calculated the centroid of the protein. The centroid took the sum of all the X, Y, and Z coordinates of all the atoms in the structure, and then you divided them by the total number of atoms in the structure, right? We just did that. The centroid of the residue is going to be calculated by the same method. However, 
the only difference is that you will only be summing up the x y and z coordinates of the atom in that residue and dividing by that that by the number of atoms again in only that residue so we will need to slightly modify the existing code we recycled most of the old code and saved up on some compute time we see that the two for loops are already set up in a way that we can take advantage of and instead of writing more for loops so we start by creating two empty lists one called r c e n and the other one called r name the purpose of r c e n is to hold the centroid of each amino acid and the purpose of r name is to hold the three letter code of each amino acid to which the centroid corresponds to following this change we move to we move inside the first for loop and we introduce analogs of the first line that we wrote x y z and atom count and we introduce the analogs as res underscore x res underscore y and res underscore z and res atom count all of these four values are initialized at zero in the same way that we created the ones at the top right so in the second for loop we repeat these four commands that I've just highlighted and with slight changes. So instead of having X, Y, Z and atom count, we now have res X, res Y, res Z and res atom count and everything else remains exactly the same. So after coming out of the first for loop down here, what we have to do is we have to take these sums and divide by the atom count in the residue. And this leads us uh, in the same way down here as we did for the centroid of the whole protein. It introduces us to the, cent the X coordinate, the Y coordinate and the Z coordinate of the centroid of this particular residue. We then take these three values, make it into an array and, and save it in the list called rsend, which we created up here. We, at the same time, we also add the name of the residue in the uh, list called rname. We append to it. These are the couple of things that we have to change uh, from the previous code going forward. And you will notice that because we had already done all the work to calculate the centroid of the whole protein, we use the same code practically to calculate the centroid of each of the residues and save them in uh, respective variables. So up till now, what we have done is uh, that we use the all atom coordinates to calculate the position of the centroid of the protein. We then slightly modified the code to get the centroid of the residues. So we now have all the data we need, the center of the protein and one point representing each amino acid in the protein. So in the next step, we will find the distance between the protein centroids and each residue's centroid. This is the last step before we start our analysis to find the support for our hypothesis. To find distance, we need to add a few more lines of code. So this block at the end shows a piece of code which is going to be used by us to calculate the distances. What we're going to do is we're going to use the distance formula and coordinate geometry to calculate the distances of each of the centroid of the residues from the center of the protein. To do that, we will subtract the centroid coordinates of the protein from the centroids of each of the residues. We will then square each of those components and add them up and take the square root. And this final square root is going to give us distance D. Since this for loop is running over each of the centroids, we are going to append to this list that we, which is an empty list in the beginning. We're going to append to this list uh, in order uh, the distances of each of the centroids. When the for loop completes, we will have a list of distances for each amino acid. However, there are 142 residues in our protein because we're also counting the heme cofactor. If we are to have a 142 residue long list, it is not exactly ideal, especially because there are just 20 unique amino acids. So basically you should have uh, something like a distribution or uh, any kind of spread which condenses the data that you have. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a few more lines to our code, which is going to take the existing data and simplify it so that our analysis later on becomes simpler. So we talked about this distance code and I wanted to show you what I meant when I said that the data is not very friendly. So if we were to now print the residue names in order and we were to print their distances, we will see that the first residue is a valine and the distance is approximately 18.3 angstroms. And then if you go down a couple of places, you will notice that there is another valine down here and the distance for that is 12.9 angstroms, right? So the same amino acids are repeating multiple times. So what I have done now is that I have added a few more lines to make this data uh, show up in a more um, friendlier manner. So the way we did this was that 
uh, I previously had each list initialized as a Python variable. And if I were to do some array operations on those Python lists, they will not work out because the array operations come specifically from the numpy library so these two commands uh, np dot as array converts our name which is if i remind you the list that contains the amino acid names or the three letter codes and the dist is where you have the distances between each of the residue centroids and the centroid of the protein so these two variables are name and dist are now numpy arrays and you can do uh, numpy operations on them so what we're going to do is we're going to take our list our name which contains uh, these three letter amino acid codes which are shown in the table above and it is going to apply the function called unique to it so what this is going to do is that it is going to extract only the unique three letter amino acids codes valine valine the three letter code for which is VAL appears 30 times in the list AA it will only appear once because the rest of the 29 times it is the same thing repeating over and over again right the last bit is a slightly condensed version so the np dot where command lets me find the entry that i'm looking for in a particular array the index zero just extracts all the indices so this highlighted piece of code is going to iterate so the for loop is going to iterate over the amino acid it picks up the amino acid let's say valine it is going to find valine in the list r name and get me the indices so basically it is looking at our name which contains all of these and it is going to bring up position one position 10 and so on and so forth so position one will is actually showing up as position one but in python indexing it is position zero so position zero and position nine and all the following positions of valine will show up and then we are going to extract the values of those particular indices in the dist which contains the actual distances. So what, when I run this block, it is going to display a table, but that table is not going to be as long as this table. So this table is 142 rows uh, long, but this new table is just going to have entries, alanine only once, arginine only once, and all the way down to valine only once, but they will all have an array in front of them. Right. So these arrays now have, so all the alanines in this particular protein have a distribution of distance 21, 20, 11, 11, 15, 17, 13, 9, 7, etc. So as I said before, the purpose of this exercise was to simplify the output part, right? So instead of having a 142 roll long table, we now only have a handful of rows and uh, which makes life a lot easier. So that's it for now. For a given structure, you have now obtained a list of distances of all the residues from the center of the protein. The post analysis part, so once you have all the distances, how you're going to convert that into graphs or distributions or histograms or whatever you feel like showing this data is, that is up to you. Uh, you have the distances, you can make histograms or you can just show them in any other way. Obviously you can, you will have to run this code for multiple proteins. So we've only run it for one protein, right? We ran it only for one hv4.pdb to get significant data you will have to repeat the same process with 10,000 or 100,000 different protein structures and collect distributions of each of the amino acids from them if you do not sample enough structures your analysis will be inaccurate and your sample size should definitely be large because this is a standard thing in a uh, standard thing in statistics that if you do not sample a big enough population whatever parameter you're estimating will be inaccurate or will be very far away from uh, the real value of that parameter another thing that i wanted to add to this was that i have just demonstrated what i've just demonstrated is an approximation for instance if you have a very large structure for example a ribosome which has thousands of amino acids you will get a very wide distribution so for example uh, you will get amino acids the same amino acids which are very close to the center and which are very far away from the center and which are scattered evenly in between right and then if you try to compare the distribution of the ribosome with the distribution of uh, this hemoglobin molecule which has the id that we're working with one hv4 the comparison will not be accurate what you have to do in that case is that you have to normalize your data so how will that work you, what you will do is you will take this length 21.1 and you will divide that by for instance the largest 
distance of any centroid from the center of the protein so that that centroid gets converted into one and this will scale accordingly. Once you do the normalization, then you are able to correctly compare across different structures. Again, I would like to stress that this is just a coding exercise and uh, the real way, for instance, uh, to address the same question would be, for example, a better way would be to do solvent accessibility analysis. So the way to do that would be that you can use a program called N-Axis. I will leave a link to that in the description below. That program actually calculates the solvent accessible surface area. So you can give your entire protein to that program and that program will actually calculate the solvent accessible area of each of the uh, amino acids in your protein. That would be a much better way to address the same question because in this particular exercise, we assumed that all proteins are globular and can fit into a sphere. And we all know that that is not accurate because some proteins can be fibrillar, which means that they can be more long than they are wide. And if you have this kind of skewness, you do not have proteins which adhere to globular natures, right? So in that case, um, N-axis would give you a much better approximation. Again, the purpose of this exercise was just to demonstrate how to extract data from a protein structure and how to address a research-related question from it. The method may be inexact, but it demonstrates to you how using coding, you can extract uh, relevant information and analyze it uh, to get the kind of answers that you're looking for. So with this post, I will now be concluding the protein structure series since uh, we have covered just enough to get a beginner started in this area. If you have any questions and want a tutorial in this subject on any other aspect, for example, you want me to calculate something which is slightly different, you can uh, write to me, either put it in the comments below or you have the contact address from the IDROX contact uh, page. You can write to me. Again, if something is not clear, please feel free to ask in the comments and I'll be happy to address it. Lastly, don't forget to like and subscribe and share this video. Thank you again for watching IDROX YouTube channel.